Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about cities. I'm going to talk about cities of the future. This is my city. Um, this was this is Chicago, and uh, this photograph was actually on the cover of National Geographic in July of 2013. And you know we are known as a lot of things, the Windy City. That's about our bra bra braggart qualities, not about the wind. The city of big shoulders, the birthplace of modern architecture. And um, in 1900, as the world passed into the 20th century, it was called the city of the century. Um, one reason, because it was the fastest growing city the world had ever seen. Um, this is Chicago. I am a native Chicagoan, by the way. Um, I, uh, I don't. I know the sun rises and sets other places, but I've, I've been, um, I've, it's really associated me with a lot of the value I have in my work. This photograph was taken the year I was born in Chicago. It was taken by Stanley Kubrick, um, who at that point was the staff photographer at Look Magazine. He was in his 20s, and um, he had this assignment to capture the glamorous and the gritty sides of the city. It was called Chicago City of Extremes. Um, at that year, 1950, 29%, um, the population of Chicago, by the way, was 3.6 million. It was, that's the biggest the city ever was. And 29% of the world's population lived in cities. Um, 50 years earlier, in 1900, the population of Chicago was 1.7 million, just to give you a perspective of this century. And 14% of the world's um, people lived in cities that year, in 1900, um, and Chicago, this is really crazy, was the fifth biggest city in the world. It was, um, the only cities that were bigger at that point were London, New York City, Paris, and Berlin. And even more amazing, 60 years earlier, in 1840, there were only 5,000 people living in Chicago. So that's why I got the title of Century of the City. Another thing that I think uh, that's makes Chicago a good study is that it's, in a way it's the most American of cities because it has its growth spurt as the, as the country's changing, as it's growing, as it's expanding across the continent. And um, Chicago answered the, its rapid growth, at least some, in some ways by planning intellectually. And there's a lot of admirable things about, about um, Chicago and other cities of this era. This is a page from Daniel Burnham's Plan of Chicago, 1909. Um, what's interesting about it is that there were these beautiful drawings by a uh, watercolorist, his name was Jules de Guerin. And um, while that was impressive, it was a really practical plan. It was t talked about the improvement of the lakefront, how to improve way railway terminals, the ac acquisition of a, of a system of parks. And this systematic thinking about cities really marked the beginning of the century. These are um, two plans. I mean, everybody didn't agree, okay? These are two plans. They were done unbelievably the very same year. Um, the one on your um, left is Ville Reduce, a uh, uh, suburb outside of Paris, done by um, Swiss architect Le, Le Corbusier. And he zoned everything. He wanted to keep noise away from living, and you would do all working in one place. He wanted to maximize daylight. Um, this wasn't built. It did, ins it did inspire some other um, city ar architects and planners. Um, Lucio Costa and Oscar Niemeyer relied on, on this um, plan to do Brasilia. On the other side, Broadacre City, 1935, same year, frankly, right? Frank believed that every single family should get one acre of federal land, and that together with a motor car, radio, telephone, telegraph, standardized machine production, we might never even need to see each other but very different ideas about what cities are. And I think that we still are, are grappling with ideas of, of cities. Cities are where we live together. Um, remarkably, um, in 2000, we passed this, this mark. 50% of the world's population lived in cities. Today, it's actually, um, I think it's 56%, something like 4.4 4. 4 billion people live in cities. And uh, by 2050, 70% of people will be, um, live in cities, and they're really important because they're energy centers, they're knowledge centers. Uh, in fact, um, I've heard that 
one, one way of thinking about um, our occupation of the planet. So the 19th century is a century of empires. That was the power structure that we lived in, that the 20th century was a century of cities. And I've heard people believe that the 21st century will be the century of the city. And the reason is because about 80% of um, our gross domestic product is generated in cities. This is where we're energetic. Um, unfortunately, while cities are highly productive, they're also one of the biggest contributors to the existential challenge of our time. Basically, to stop the, the, the mortal damage that we're doing to our planet, potentially mortal damage, cities need to be fixed. They need to be rebuilt for radical sustainability. And what I'd like to talk about tonight um, I think that it's the role of every citizen, but also every architect to take on the challenge of sustainability. It's not tomorrow's challenge, it's today's challenge. And um, what I wanna talk about it, are little projects and big projects. They're all eligible. They all have to be part of the solution. I'm gonna use my city, Chicago, and some of the projects that, um, that we've done as examples of, of, of challenges and maybe some potential solutions. And the first thing I want to talk about is I think that the new city, the radically sustainable city, is, has to be safe. And so um, when I showed you that picture, it looked really beautiful, didn't it? Actually, that was on the cover of National Geographic because um, it was using Chicago as a poster child for an article about light pollution. That year, um, who, the uh, World Health Organization had identified light pollution as a possible carcinogen. So even though you flew into Chicago and it was this like beautiful golden carpet, it was not a good thing. And I think that um, this is one of the things that cities need to deal with, is whether they make us unhealthy. Um, noise pollution, for example, this is an uh, expressway in Chicago. It's the, da uh, it's the Eisenhower, if you are a Chicagoan or you know the city. Um, if you are waiting on a platform for that train in the middle, the platform noise is um, about 90 decibels. So you couldn't work on that platform. That's above what OSHA allows for a work environment. But this is the good news. Uh, we, as individual architects, we have this extraordinary power, superpower design to solve those problems incrementally. And it doesn't have to be a huge pro project. I don't think, maybe I will. Not that I won the gold medal, I'm kidding. I don't think anyone is ever going to ask me to design Brasilia, okay? And I'm certainly not going to redesign Chicago, but we have the power, we have the superpower to make design changes. So for example, this is a little, um, really tiny little project. We were asked by the uh, Chicago Transit Authority, the CTA, to solve that problem of building a station in the middle of that noisy, uh, of that noisy expressway. And uh, what we proposed was doing a precast canopy, known technology. If we um, added um, uh, the right aggregates, we could do it as a self-cleaning material, particularly effective in that environment. Concrete is about the only material that could give us the acoustic improvement that we needed in that environment, and it gives us the uh, it gives us the requirement that a canopy has, weather and daylighting. Um, Unfortunately, this was a design proposal, but I, wa I want to use it as a really little example. The reason it didn't get built, by the way, is um, we work we've been working for the CTA for th over 30 years, and I am we know a lot of the CTA people, and the chief engineer, his name is Jim Harper. I said, Jim, why can't we build this? And he said, Well, you know, Carol, concrete is a new material, and I said, Well, well, the Romans used it, <laughs> but. But, but the important thing is the idea is out there. That's what we architects do. That's what you do. That's your power. Um, they may build it someday. I still think it's a great idea. When, during, um, during COVID in particular, we were really tuned in, in my studio, a new way to whether buildings are healthy or not. And I'm going to give you an example that uh, it's a building that we actually completed before COVID. It's a, a little visitor center for Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, simple, simple program. Uh, Lincoln Park is uh, a free zoo, so you, they don't, you don't have to pay money. You just pass through a gateway and you're in. Um, so this building has first aid. It has that. It has a, a 
members lounge, and that number two up there is where they try to sell you a membership since you don't have to pay to get in. But we wanted to make that, uh, it was our idea that we wanted to make that really open, like people would just flow by that uh, side up desk. And we had this idea that if you were coming into a garden, a zoological garden, there shouldn't be barriers between you and the, um, and the, uh, and the, and the garden. And so um, we proposed, and actually the owner accepted this idea to make a, uh, a, a building that moves, that changes itself. So in good weather, you could remove the wall. And when it's cold in Chicago, which is now and then, you would have a wall, but it would, it would bring people much closer. Unfortunately, when the building came online, the gentleman who maintained it was not the same one who was our client during design, and he said, I'm not opening and closing this building. It takes 20 minutes. <laughs> so, okay. Um, what we learned during COVID is the quality of air and how buildings can transform are, is essential. Again, a little example. Um, I think that um, the idea of a safe building in a safe city is a critical one to do a radically sustainable city, to change cities. Um, the next um, area that we are really, really interested in um, to be radically sustainable, cities um, need to be resilient. And that means both sustainable buildings and infrastructure, they're both part of the solution. Um, I mean, basically, I think you can describe um, or define a resiliency as maintaining livable, livability in changing conditions uh, or, or um, mitigating deteriorating conditions, just basically protecting the city. And um, for us, for architects, working at any scale, um, that's it. You can do it at any scale. So I'm going to show you um, a really small scale. This is a hamburger stand. This is the, um, we did two projects. Oh, I, I lied to you. This one is it in Chicago. That's in Walt Disney World. Okay, sorry. Um, but in any case, um, we were um, asked to do two hamburger stands um, for McDonald's. They're both, by the way, um, flagship. So I wish I could tell you that they use this as their standard going forward. I'm still working on that. Um, but they're small. Uh, the Chicago store is 19,000 square feet. The Walt Disney store is 8,000 square feet um, outside and about 5,000 inside. Um, Chicago was completed in 2019, and it's the first lead platinum um, fast food restaurant in the United States. And um, uh, Lake, uh, Walt Disney World at Lake Bu uh, Buena Vista. Um, is on track to, it was finished in 2020. We're just finishing up the documentation um, as a living building, net zero energy building. So even with these small buildings, with ridiculously energy intensive programs, design makes the difference. Um, i show you just a little bit about each one of them, hopefully really quickly. Um, we, this is Chicago. Um, very urban environment. We were kind of shocked when McDonald's called us. We'd never really even worked for a, a not public client before, and it was like, McDonald's is calling you. I can't figure out why. Um, so we asked them, why, why do you want to uh, work with us? And they said, well, we think that your research method and your ideas about place and community could inform this restaurant. So to give you a little bit of background, this restaurant has been here for, for a while. It's, I think it was first built in the 80s. And uh, the owner, if you've been to Chicago, was originally called the Rock and Roll McDonald's because there's even a song about the Rock and Roll McDonald's, a pop song. Anyway, um, it, the owner had a lot of pop uh, memorabilia. It's no longer there. But they, they, you can see that they um, remodeled it really, really regularly. Um, and the neighborhood had been changing at the, as they remodeled it. it, it it has changed. It's right as you come into Chicago, you can get off the interstate and uh, basically come into River North, the area just north of um, the downtown, and connect actually to Michigan Avenue and the Mag Mile. There's a lot of other flagships in this area, too. Um, but what McDonald's wanted to do is they wanted to be a good neighbor. They said, this area is changing to residential. We want to be a good neighbor. So they got us. We, we fell for that hook, line, and sinker. And so we said, well, if you're a good neighbor, what about environmental stewardship? And we said, we think that you can do this building and you know, to measure the skid, because LEED just measures the skid. I mean, the building has to be a good building. It has to operate really well. Um, anyway, we said, we think we can make it LEED Platinum. And they kind of laughed because they had studied this before. 
Um, but we took the challenge on, and um, I want to show you some of the very simple things that we do, because I think that the essence of design is the integration of simple ideas, making sure that each, each proposal, each concept, each strategy um, supports the next one, that it does more than one thing. So, um, for example, um, the most sustainable building is the one you don't build. And the second most sustainable building is the one where you reuse the building. And so we were able to reuse 65% of that original uh, rock and roll footprint. Real simple strategy. Um, when we were working on this building, our idea was that we'd like to make a lot more green area. And in fact, this is a lot more green area than they had. We still have parking. Um, interesting. Even in this very urban McDonald's, 50% of their of traffic is still automobile. It's still, um, it's still in cars. Anyway, um, when we decided that we would make it a, basically a McDonald's and a park is what we called it, we realized that all our new trees wouldn't create a lot of shade in Chicago, which gets not as hot as Dallas, but we get pretty hot. And so um, we decided we would do a pergola and it, we talk, talked about it more, the idea that every single strategy has to do more than one job. Uh, we created shade with um, solar canopies. There's about 1,000 solar canopies. Um, they are south facing. And um, they generate about 60% of the energy uh, that this McDonald's uses, which is, it exceeds what we thought we could do. And um, actually, the graph at the bottom, we were, we were really lucky to be able to audit this um, building. And that's the actual use and production, so it's working pretty well. Um, other ideas, um, the idea of, of biophilia, that people feel more comfortable in a space that's natural was a really important um, design um, um, form giver for this. And you can see here that um, we've used uh, natural materials as often as we can, including plants, in fact, um, We've planted even the roof in this case, not, not this little hang down garden, but on the roof we have apple trees, arugula. Um, McDonald's actually harvests those things and it, Chicago is an ordinance, if you grow food, you can't use it in the restaurant where it's grown. Um, so it goes to Ronald McDonald House and they, they use it there. Um, uh, one of the things we haven't done, but that, that is on our agenda to do, is to, um, this building, um, I, we believe it'll qualify for net zero carbon, but I want to talk particularly about, I mean, making it low energy and having the renewables gives us low um, um, operational carbon, but embodied carbon also is super important to us on this. And this is, um, believe it or not, this building I told you was occupied in 2019, it was the first use of cross-laminated timber um, in Chicago for a commercial building. And now, look what we're doing four years later. This is really incredible. That's really progress. Um, because this is a material that doesn't injure the planet so much. Also, this was the first project that we used carbon cure or, or CO2 and trained concrete. So just on this little building where we're just doing a couple more foundations, we sequestered about 30,000 pounds of carbon. So those were really important um, ideas for us. And in my studio, we believe that if we solve those problems, if we make it buildable, if we make it economic, and if we make it eminently functional, it will be beautiful. And so um, this is a joke. My, my boss at IIT is Reed Kurloff, and he wanted me to lecture about why McDonald's looks like a Miesian building. I told him it doesn't, but he did this drawing for me. Um, but if, if you meet those goals, it will be beautiful. So. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the, our, this um, the restaurant sibling. This is the one in Walt Disney World. Um, it's funny because uh, we challenged McDonald's. We said, "Can we do a, you know, a lead platinum restaurant?" And then we they came back. Uh, by the way, I have to, one of the things about doing public work. I'm going to show you another project in a minute that took us like two decades to do. When you work for McDonald's, we go from commission to completion in 14 months. It's like, wow, it's not even a world that architects know. Um, except maybe if you're in China, I'm not sure. But oh, we had a really slow project in China too, so I take that back. Um, so they came back a few months after the first one was done and they said, well, this one we want to be net zero. 
And we had the numbers. We knew how hard it would be to make it net zero. And we said, oh, yeah, you're going to buy credits, right? No, we want this to be net zero on the site, renewable. So um, this is the restaurant. By the way, I'm not going to tell you the origin of this one, but I will tell you that we replaced, again, this is, we, it's partly a remodel. We kept um, about half the building. And the uh, original building that we were remodeling was done by Venturi Scott Brown, and it looked like a Happy Meal. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, we did accomplish uh, net zero. Uh, the, this shows you how uh, the amount of uh, photovoltaics that we um, used. We used two different types, by the way. They both, by the way, are operating more efficiently than, um, than our design calculations showed. But the key to it, and, and we, did, we did evaluate other things. We looked at geothermal, we looked at wind, um, but um, this is where, this was the real key. Since it was an existing restaurant, we knew that it was using about a million kilowatt hours a year. You can see it in the tall, tall column on the right. And so the first thing we did is um, we looked at how we could drive that number down. Because, yeah, we could, we could make any building net zero if you have enough PV, but that's not the point. I mean, it's, it's the economy of, of use that is really important. If we're going to save the planet, we can't build so much stuff or buy so much stuff. Anyway, um, so we were doing a million. And you can see the yellow part of that bar. That's equipment. And that's cooking. And um, one of the things we learned working for, for this McDonald's is that it has, it has four cooking lines. If anyone ever worked in a McDonald's, you know McDonald's, some of them have one, some of them have two cooking lines. However many lines they have, they're always on because someone may arrive, and in this restaurant it's true because the buses pull up, and order 300 Big Macs and you have to get them out right away. So um, all their equipment was always on. So believe it or not, one of the reasons that this building can be net zero is we worked with the equipment manufacturer to, to develop a standby. Like, that's a no-brainer. Um, but I do want to talk to you about the things that I really like doing. Um, if you look, I'm sorry, I put the green is, the yellow is, oh, I'm screwing up here. Green is cooking equipment. Yellow is cooling, and that's mostly air conditioning. So um, think human comfort. And so... Um, the part that we found is exciting is we started thinking about human comfort and what does it, what is human comfort, especially what's human comfort in this part of the world. So um, on the right-hand side of the screen, the top graph, that is Florida um, with no shade and no air movement. And the months, the hours of the day are planted, are on the, on the vertical and the months of the year are on the horizontal. And red is where you can't, most people cannot, will not be comfortable outside. And in this condition, it's about 65% um, of the year. However, look at the bottom. If you shade and ventilate, that's what you're dealing with. That's what you need to air condition. So basically our proposal was to ventilate the restaurant, create a lot of outdoor eating space, and basically rethink what's comfortable. Like, do you have to air, be air conditioning it to a certain temperature? McDonald's um, agreed. And um, this building, um, we, did, we did build the big, the big outdoor seating area. But for our indoor seating area, um, to ventilate it, um, we used like an old Florida technique. You can see in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, the jealousy window. Like, why did Florida have those? We know now. The only thing that's different, though, is our jealousy is tied into the uh, building automation system, to the mechanical system. So when we hit the right numbers, outside air temperature, humidity, um, the building opens up. And uh, we have fans that will induce ventilation. And so basically, the building is, is um, breathing itself. Um, I have to tell you, though, one funny thing that did happen during the design of this building. You know, McDonald's is sued often. You probably all have read about the $3 million hot cup, cup of coffee, that sort of thing. So actually, our designs go past their, their legal. They were really worried about this because the jealousy was like your garage door. When it hit something, it would release. But you, you might get your fingers pinched for a second and... McDonald's like, no, we can't do it. So we finally settled on this building. It talks. It says, the building is about to breathe. Please keep your fingers away from the windows. <laughs> and so that's how we solved it. I, that's designed too, isn't it? OK. Anyway, so we did accomplish um, net zero. 
small buildings. I mean, you can't get smaller than hamburger stand. The only thing I, I will admit we didn't do, um, Blair came and reviewed both of these buildings. He's the, uh, used to be the Tribune critic, architecture critic. He said, Carol, these can't be sustainable. You're still serving beef. Maybe that's the next project, I don't know. <laughs> but, but resilience happens at a city scale too. And I'm gonna show you, this is my 20 year project, the Chicago Riverwalk. Um, by the numbers, it's a mile and a half long, 10 city blocks. It's about 45 feet wide, so it's a little bit like Spaghetti Park. Um, it was constructed from 2005 to 2016, but we worked on it from, um, we were commissioned in 2000, and we finally finished it in 2016. The total investment by the city is a little less than $200 million. So that's sort of the numbers on this thing. But the more amazing thing is the massive change it made to Chicago um, for a relatively small investment. I mean, $200 million is not a big investment for a city. And um, it changed Chicago's economy. It changed Chicago's image of itself and the perception of other people. And so in a way, it's, it's um, the, the, the investment, the return is amazing. and. It's a multi-season public space. Um, it's a new face for the city. Everybody takes their friends there. I'm sure if you've been there, you've had a glass of wine. When we were designing this, we were sitting in the studio and we said, wouldn't it be nice if we had a wine bar here? Sure enough, one of the first tenants that signed up was a wine bar. I mean, this was you know just luck to start out with. Um, in any case, no, it has a much bigger role to play in the city. No, not bigger. It has an additional role to play in the city, and it's one that you don't see. And I do want to talk about that, because I think this is the brilliance of design and architecture that only we can do. Um, for example, in the River Theater, uh, we save, we, we gather stormwater, and we use it to irrigate. Um, by the way, I have to tell you that um, doing a project like this, I didn't do it. I get a lot of credit, but I had really wonderful creative partners. Sasaki uh, was a landscape architect. I had a wonderful local landscape architect, Jacobs Ryan. Um, civil engineers, marine consultants, marine traffic consultants, marine life consultants, um, code consultants. And I, um, I'm just the lucky person who gets to, uh, you know, sort of like ask all the dumb questions. Anyway, another space that maybe you've been to, this one's called the Jetty. Um, the theme of this is, is to show what a, a river, a natural river in Illinois would be like. So we have floating um, plants and we have some fishing piers. And um, that's only half the story. Oh, by the way, I took this picture. It's about a two or three pound river cat. Uh, Mayor Daley, the first Mayor Daley, not Mayor Daley the son, because we've had several Mayor Daley's, as you all know. Um, one, of his, one of his quotes, his famous things he said, is someday he was going to sit by the river, pull fish out, and put them on the barbecue. You can do that now at the Riverwalk, just want you to know. Um, but what you don't see is what's happening below this improvement. Below this improvement we've created one of the world's largest fish hotels, which is important because in an uh, urban environment like the Chicago River, all the habitat is, has been destroyed, it's channelized. We basically have a concrete river. But by um, creating that environment, basically you can see that we, we created hulus and lunkers, places for fish to hide. Um, the water plants actually provide a food source for the fish. The Chicago River is stacked by the state of Illinois. Um, and um, I want to show you this because the fish are very happy. Um, this is a census in 1975. And um, at that point, there were seven species of fish in the Chicago River. And uh, the 2000, and it's about 2015, you can see it. There's over 75 species of fish in the Chicago River and they're growing and they're prosperous and they're, you know, they're propagating. Um, it's not just about the Riverwalk. I would be lying to you if I said that. You can see that really important things happened here. Chicago used to chlorinate the, Chicago had this really, really good scam. We made, we made all our water dirty. At first, by the way, Chicago drains into Lake Michigan, but that was a bad thing because that's where our drinking water is. So 1900, got this great idea. We dug a canal through our watershed, sent all our sewage down to St. Louis. Of course, that didn't last very long, and St. Louis sued Chicago many, many times. Um, so uh, well, the water was chlorinated to clean it up, but when it was chlorinated and returned to the river that way, it killed the fish. 
So dechlorination, you can see that um, happening um, about 1985. And then um, TARP is a water management program that involved holding stormwater rather than um, letting it into the environment. And so that was an important thing too. So again, design is about finding the components that make it a one, a, a integrated singular solution. So my river walk, my river walk, everybody's river walk is part of it. Um, it's also, Chicago River also functions, the river walk functions as a part of Chicago's stormwater management system. Um, about two weeks after phase two opened, by the way, we opened in three phases, which is a whole story. If you want to know about it, I'll tell you, it's very political. We had to um, pass a new, new legislation and get a very uh, wonderful loan from the federal government to do this. So it was built three phases. But anyway, um, after about a couple weeks after phase um, two opened, this happened. And Blair came and called and he said, is this a design error? <laughs> it would be a huge design error. Whose liability covers that one? Um, no. The river is an integral part of the stormwater management system, so it required that we design everything about the river to keep, to keep up to seven feet of stormwater for a short period of time. Uh, this drawing shows that a little bit better. Um, actually, like other cities, um, it says our highest recorded event we designed for it. We've had a higher recorded event since then. Um, what happens is they open the locks to the, uh, to the lake, and for a while we pollute the lake again. But in any case, again, design is integrated. It's not one thing. The last thing I want to talk to you about, though, is um, we are really interested. Can cities be sustainable if they're not livable, if they're not just, if they're not inclusive? And so um, I think that a lot of the projects that we like to do, that we undertake, are really concentrated on the idea of livability. What does it take to make people have meaningful lives in, in a city environment? You know, the Riverwalk is so interesting. Um, I told you it was a really, had a really great ROI. Um, all these buildings were built since um, 2008. That's, so that's after the first phase of the Riverwalk opened. I mean, that's not a little thing for a city. However, the Riverwalk, um, it's in the middle of our downtown. And there are kids in our city that probably, you know, they don't get down to downtown at all. Um, there are whole areas of our city that don't have green areas or recreation areas or attractions. So one of the projects that we were really anxious to do, we did this while we were doing the Riverwalk and then after, so we worked for the um, uh, Metropolitan Planning Council of Chicago at the request of the city to do a vision for Chicago, but particularly to do a vision of, for Chicago's rivers. Could we take the benefit that we had discovered by designing the Riverwalk, could we do that distribute it to the whole city? Chicago has 34 miles of lakefront. Almost all of it's in public land, and it's celebrated. You know, everybody says, wow, have you seen Chicago's lakefront? It looks just like Rio. Um, but you can see from our lopsided city here that probably half the people are not within 10, 15 miles of the lakefront. Um, we have 155 miles of river. Could we change those rivers to be the same sort of asset that the Chicago River um, became downtown? Um, so this is mostly a planning and a vision study. I'll show you one funny little one that I love. Um, we did um, a series of, of goals and then visions working with MPC. Um, this one is um, on the south side of Chicago. It's a, a neighborhood called Little Village. And they had just got a new park from the city. It's up there in the right-hand corner of the screen. And we went out. Um, to have a uh, community meeting. We had over 500 community meetings to do this report. In any case, um, this little canal was dug when um, this was an industrial area because so much, uh, so much material came in on boats that it was profitable to dig these little canals. This one is sort of a remnant. And we were talking about the river around their park, and there were some really smart-ass teenage boys, and they said, do you know what we call this? We call it Ass Creek. It smells so bad. <laughs> and um, what was happening is there was so much stagnation. I mean, there's still, there's still organic material in the river from the days of, 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 of the stockyards and the, and the slaughterhouses. 
Um, and it's stagnant. And yeah, they were right. So we decided we would turn what they called Ass Creek into Acid Creek. And um, basically what this explores is if you can encapsulate that muck and if you can um, uh, plant um, trees that will mitigate it or plants that will mitigate it, could you actually do it as um, not just a park, but a park and a swimming pool too. And these ideas, uh, um, it's interesting from this, they, we, they, we didn't get to build this one yet. However, um, after the study was published, um, there, there, the Chicago Community Trust, which is um, one of the grant makers in Chicago, started a river fund, and communities applied for planning fees, so they uh, planning uh, projects, so they could actually start this. So they had a lot of legs. Um, I don't think a city can be just unless it has good transportation, fair transportation. People talk about food deserts. There are transportation deserts, too. And if you can't get to your job, there's no chance you can be a, 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 man, a, a contributing member of society. We've had done um, a series of projects that have been really great because they're restoring service in different parts of the city. Here are two stations that are in, insert stations. They both um, did exist in the past. And when planners felt that the automobile world, the brave new world of the 60s in the interstate were going to overtake our cities, um, these stations were demolished. And so um, we did two stations um, pretty much in the same time frame. And um, I'm showing them to you because they require the creativities that architects bring to the table. Often projects like this, public works projects, has, have a lead, uh, the engineer is the lead. Engineers and architects are really great partners, but engineers are guys who know every possible thing about something. Architects are people who know everything, something about everything. So that's really, that's like an essential overlap here. What we do that's different, what we architects do, is we see the whole project. So these are really different. Um, uh, this one is that in, um, uh, if you know Chicago, this is in the Fulton Market District. Um, the solution, oh, when we do these, by the way, one of the curious things is even though we're building on the same, um, usually turn of the century structure, train structure, the bed structure, it won't meet modern code. So if we add the same platform back that they used to have, we can't. We have to fortify this. And it's always hard. I, um, so, for example, this one, what we did is we underpinned every one of those old bents. Um, we had very little space to build a station, so basically we built a vertical station in uh, the space of three parking spaces. Uh, the other one I showed you, this is um, at McCormick Place. Um, in a way, it had the same problem. Uh, we couldn't put uh, more weight on, on the bent structure. So here what we did is um, we decided, well, we'll take, we won't put weight on the bent structure and go back one slide. And instead, we built a, co a concrete bent that exists alongside. So the tracks are on the old steel bent structure, the 1900 structure. We put a new bent structure, uh, concrete bent in for the platforms and the canopies, which also were a little bit different problem than the, the, the Morgan one. Here, what we did, and we had such a small right of way. You would never build this. We have 15 foot for a platform. If, the, uh, if we met CTA standards, this would be a 25 foot platform. So that's how undersized we were. So we decided, okay, we'll take everything possible off the platform. Well, what we have on the platform is we have canopies, um, windbreaks, and we finally said, well, what if we put them all together? Then we could do this wonderful tube. It would do one, one again, one thing, doing a lot of work. And not only that, um, this was able to be um, fabricated and then shipped to the site and lifted into place. If you're working on an active train line um, and you want to um, install something, it requires flagging. So every time, it, basically you want to cut down the time that you interrupt the train as much as possible. So all those things work together to make a good design solution, essential to radical sustainability, we believe. And so here you can see the that that tube, and then you can see the two bent structures living together. Last project I'm going to show you. Um, it's a project we're working on now um, because I think um, there are other ways to think about how to create equity. This is a project we're doing for the uh, Chicago Park District. It is uh, a park. It's DuSable Park, 
And Dusabo was the first um, non-indigenous person to live in the, to live in Chicago. So uh, when you're being not PC, they, they call him the city city founder or father. But uh, we're not supposed to do that. We're just bringing history, I think, in. But in any case, um, it, the site is really really nice. It's a three acre site. These are our design drawings, by the way. We're, we're just finishing design development, so hopefully this park will begin construction next year. It's a three-acre site. It's right at the lakefront and um, at the mouth of the Chicago River. So it's at Chicago's birthplace. This is where Chicago um, grew, both, both as an indigenous settlement and as a, a, later, um, a later settlement. Um, one of the things that was really kind of um, interesting, we did a really extensive um, community engagement for this. We love doing community engagement. Um, and one of the pieces, we had a, a, a awareness budget. And the uh, Chicago Architectural Biennial asked us to contribute um, to it. So we decided we would use that as our awareness piece. And we pr produced this. This was at the Art Institute. Um, it's a drawing that we did called, it's called um, Parallel Histories. And what you're seeing is uh, the original lakefront is um, the brown, sort of, it has a, a sandbar going in front of the river. Everything else has been added. So it's the parallel histories one after another. Um, just as a, as a, I see if I get my pointer up here, I want to point out something to you. Um, um, Dusable's cabin was right there. You see my red mark? That's where he was. And that used to be right at the river, right at the lakefront. And this is where our park is. So we've moved a, a little bit out there. Interesting, interesting thing about Chicago, we just make new land. Oh, anyway. Um, we also were really um, interested in, 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 okay, so the, the biennial was mounted for what, four or five months. You had to go to the, um, to the um, cultural center to see it. Uh, we were invited to um, do uh, uh, an installation in addition to our printed map, a site installation. So this is our site that you can see the river, you can see the lake, and that little, um, that little thing is our, that's our installation. It's the same size as DuSable's house. And on one side it says, who was DuSable? Which is really interesting because Chicago don't know. Who, this, is, this guy is, you know, he's like the first guy in Chicago. Nobody really knows who he is. So, um, if you, we have QR codes. We designed um, a website that tells you who's, who DeSable is. But it's interesting because we don't really know that much about him. Um, when you get on the QR codes, for example, you'll see this, and it shows you how important Chicago was because it was, it, it connected the, basically the Gulf of Mexico to, uh, to the North Atlantic Ocean. That's why Chicago is important. It's important because it's easy to get stuff across our country before railroads and anything else. So with a town that grew there, put stuff together. You know, everybody dropped their stuff off. We put it together and sent it everywhere else. Um, so I mean, trade is what this city was about. Um, so Usabel was a trader. Actually, we don't know that much about him. This is a 1930 illustration. Um, it was. It was done for the Century of Progress a little bit before. They built a log cabin uh, for the Century of Progress. And um, you can see the little illustration of it. He actually had a mansion. Seriously, it was a big house, 20 by 40. Um, there are no records of DuSable's life before um, about 1770. We think he was born in Haiti. And we think he was, in, he was um, born to an enslaved Haitian woman and a Frenchman. And so he's a black man which is even more interesting. One of the reasons he left Chicago, he lived there only um, for about 20 years, is because um, it was becoming part of, Illinois was becoming part of the United States and they weren't as tolerant as the French. In any case, he moved to Iowa, okay? Uh, but he was married to a Potawatomi, and we actually do have his um, records, his marriage records. Her name was Kitty Hawa. Um, and when he left Chicago, he sold his property to another Chicago pioneer who's not very favorably remembered, John Kinsey. Um, and he sold it, I think, the, I, I can't remember the comparable 
number was, but like millions of dollars. So he was a rich man with a, with a big estate. By the way, he died in 1818 in St. Charles, Missouri. That's one of the other documents we have about him. Oh, here I have the number. He sold his estate for 6,000 pounds, which is worth about one and a half million dollars. And this is a bill of sale. It, it, it was registered in, um, in Detroit. And you can see it's written in French. And this is what he had. He had all this stuff that he sold. He had 40 pigs and um, all this good stuff. So part of our park is to illustrate that. You can see here, this, is, this footprint is as big as his house. And then in the, in the uh, screens, we're going to show all his possessions since we knew what they were. But the other side of our installation asks a different question. And in a way, it's equally important as who was de Sable at you know, what did he do for Chicago? It's the question about who found Chicago. And when this went up, it, by the way, it lights up at night. It's really pretty cool. Um, and we did it for $24,000. So we have some very small commissions. Um, anyway, um, people call, would call and they'd say, or they'd run across me and they'd say, don't you mean who founded Chicago? No, we mean who found Chicago. Um, this, in our park, we're still hoping to do this light display to represent the Council of the Three Fires. The original um, indigenous, Chicago had, was occupied for 800 years before Tusabo got there. The Chippewa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi, um, and they were an alliance, a, basically a language-based alliance called the Council of the Three Fires, so we have our three fires. Um, but they aren't the only people. Here, the, by the way, we showed his, his outbuildings using snow fence because we ran out of money. <laughs> but um, who found Chicago? In 1912, my grandmother found Chicago. She was an immigrant from Poland. It was the poorest place on the planet then. She found Chicago. And she worked. She was a maid in a rooming house. She worked to make this the place it is today. We all found Chicago. And more important than that, we're going to have to move together forward together. And so the future city is going to require everybody's recognition and everybody's participation, everybody's commitment. It's going to be safe, it's going to be resilient, it's going to be inclusive, and it's going to be radically sustainable, and we all have a job to play. So thank you very much.